Hello again. I'm glad that you decided to join us for podcast number 12 in my series, Colonies to Colossus, The Rise of a Giant. Whether you're a regular listener or this is your first time, I'm glad to have you aboard and I hope you'll find this podcast worthwhile. I hope you'll like them enough that you'll click the like button and share them with your friends. At the end of each podcast, I present a list of articles, books, and other materials that make these podcasts particularly useful for college students who might be studying early American history. In this podcast, we take a look at Colonial New Jersey. Once called the Garden of North America by an English clergyman, New Jersey is still known as the Garden State. Blessed with leafy forests, country lanes, rolling grass-carpeted meadows, and green pine barrens, New Jersey certainly lives up to this description. In colonial times, New Jersey had no large population centers, as did her neighboring sister colonies, New York and Pennsylvania. Yet today, New Jersey is the most densely populated state. It has more people per square mile than any other state. For a time, New Jersey was divided into two colonies. As a result, many early writers referred to New Jersey as the Jerseys. During the War of Independence, New Jersey was often an unwilling no-man's land, stuck between British and American forces. The many pacifist Quakers who lived there wished to remain uncommitted to either side. New Jersey never produced a patriot firebrand such as Virginia's Patrick Henry or Samuel Adams of Massachusetts. Yet New Jersey was the location of some of the most important battles of the war and some of the most important events in American history, including Washington's crossing of the Delaware and surprise Christmas attack on the Hessian garrison at Trenton. In my last podcast, we talked about colonial New York and how it was originally founded by the Dutch. The Dutch called their colony New Netherlands, and New Jersey was part of the New Netherlands. In addition to the Dutch, there were a few scattered Swedish settlements in the south near the Delaware River. In this sense, New Jersey's history is very similar to New York's. In 1664, King Charles II of England gave the land that was New Netherlands to his brother James, the Duke of York, who himself would later become king. James assembled an army and took over the New Netherlands, including New York and New Jersey. The Dutch colony of New Amsterdam was renamed New York after James, the Duke of York. In New York, James, the Duke of York, left his friend Richard Nichols as deputy governor to run that colony. However, he granted the land that is now New Jersey to two of his friends. One was Sir George Carteret and the other was Lord John Berkeley. The name New Jersey comes from the island of Jersey, which is between England and France and the English Channel. It was a place where Sir George Carteret was from. In some of the early documents, New Jersey was also called New Caesarea. It was a medieval style arrangement that allowed Berkeley and Carteret to own and run the colony, kind of as medieval lords would run their own manors back in England. Berkeley and Carteret were not only the proprietors of New Jersey, but they were also among the proprietors of the Carolina colony, so they were in high favor with the royals back in London. In 1676, the proprietors decided to divide New Jersey into two halves. The division line started at Egg Harbor, which is along the coast of New Jersey, about 100 miles south of New York, and ran diagonally northwest up to the headwaters of the Delaware River. This created two separate colonies that were later referred to as East and West Jersey, and sometimes in older texts you hear of the Jerseys. Each colony had its own separate government. East Jersey was smaller, but more heavily populated, and it was really kind of a spillover from New York City. While West Jersey was larger, less populated, and was kind of a refuge for persecuted Quakers, it tended to move in the orbit of neighboring Pennsylvania, which was also heavily Quaker. When Berkeley and Carteret were given New Jersey as proprietors, they assumed that the right to set up government also was included in that conveyance. Unfortunately, the Duke did not have the right to convey the power to set up a government. That could only come from the king. Neighboring New York took advantage of this situation to try and take control of New Jersey, or at least quash its existence. Trouble between New York and New Jersey started from the very beginning. Richard Nichols, the governor of New York, had been granting lands on the west side of the Hudson River, thinking that it was part of New York and not knowing that it would be created as a separate colony. He was furious when he found out that James had granted the land to Berkeley and Carteret. This was a touchy situation because one of the few things that colonial governors had to 
build up a loyal following was to be able to grant land to people and make friends that way. These land grants made by the governor of New York greatly confused things later when the proprietors of New Jersey were trying to grant the same lands. Land along the Hudson River was particularly valuable. At that time, New Jersey had only one real port. It was the port of Perth Amboy, which was at the mouth of the Hudson River, just across the river from New York City. New York officials demanded that any ships going to Perth Amboy first stop in New York to pay their customs and taxes before going on to Perth Amboy. They claimed that because New Jersey didn't have a legitimate government, that they could not collect taxes. New York officials went as far as to actually send customs collectors down into New Jersey at the port of Perth Amboy to try and collect the customs there. But this ended up creating riots and they were jailed eventually. New York also sent custom collectors to patrol the mouth of the Delaware River to also collect duties there as well. Probably the most high-handed thing that New York's colonial governors did was to actually arrest New Jersey governors and bring them into New York City for trial for setting up false governments. One of New Jersey's governors, a man named John Fenwick, who was actually arrested in this situation, gave an account of what happened to him. He said, my house was beset, my door broken down, and my person seized in the nighttime by armed men sent to execute a paper ordered from the governor of New York, to whom I was sent prisoner in the depth by, of winter by sea, his order being to bring me in dead or alive, where he tried me himself being judge, keeping me in prison for the space of two years and about three months. As ridiculous as the situation is, and especially seems to us today, I think one of the things that motivated New York's colonial officials is that they were jealous and angry that they had lost so much potentially valuable land to this new colony that they really didn't want to see exist. Even after things had settled down, there were periodic attempts by New York's government to lobby important people in London to try and get New Jersey annexed to New York, and that went on for the first few decades of its existence. When the English came to occupy New Jersey and to settle it, there weren't that many Dutch there. They had tried to settle it, but disastrous wars with the Indians had caused most of the Dutch settlers to either be killed or flee. This left a pretty easy job for the English to colonize it. Unlike most other colonies, New Jersey had no vast backcountry that needed to be defended. Instead, New Jersey had a long shoreline that had to be defended. The few Indians that remained in New Jersey were of the Delaware tribe, and they were generally peaceful. They had been oppressed and conquered by other neighboring Indian tribes further to the north, and they weren't in much of a position to resist European settlement. Many of them were hired by the colonists as farmhands and to do other tasks such as cutting timber. The Quakers who lived in New Jersey generally had a humane outlook and attitude towards the Indians and the slaves. In fact, there was a Quaker organization called the Association for Helping the Indians. The first Indian reservation was set up in New Jersey. It was not meant to be a place to corral them, but rather to offer them a refuge from the flood of Europeans that were now coming in and settling. Along with firearms, liquor was one of the things that the Indians most wanted from the European settlers. Indian chiefs actually went as far as to request that the colonists tie up the drunken Indians so they wouldn't come back into camp and make trouble until they were sobered up. And as was the case in all the colonies, there were laws on the books in New Jersey restricting the sale of liquor to Indians. Drunkenness was also a problem for the colonists, and all of the colonies had laws against public drunkenness. Like all the other colonies, New Jersey had a slave population, and in New Jersey it was about one-twelfth of the total population. The numerous Quakers in New Jersey opposed slavery and made efforts to try and make their conditions better if they couldn't abolish it. New Jersey was a colony that had an abundance of food, even before the Europeans arrived, the Indians thrived on berries and nuts, fruit, melons, pumpkins, beans, and corn. The Dutch and the Swedes also introduced crops such as wheat, oats, hemp, and flax, as well as livestock. Geese, wild turkeys, deer, rabbits, and squirrels, as well as all the plenty that came from the sea, also abounded in New Jersey along its coast and in its forests, so it could support a large population. By the time of the American Revolution, New Jersey was the primary state that engaged in sheep raising. By about 1700, the population of East and West Jersey combined was about 10,000 people. The proprietors of both these two colonies had become weary of trying to govern, and the people themselves were not happy with the proprietors or their government. In addition to this, there was the constant interference from neighboring New York. 
to try and relieve themselves of the burden of governing, the proprietors of both East and West Jersey approached the king and entered into negotiations to see if the king would take over the governing of the colony. The king agreed, and in 1702, New Jersey became a royal colony. The terms and conditions of the agreement included that the two Jerseys would be united into one colony, now called New Jersey, and like other royal colonies, the king would get to appoint the governor. The proprietors of East and West Jersey continued on and got to keep their land, and they were promised by the king as a concession that the legislature would not be allowed to tax their unimproved land. One other item that was stipulated too was that the legislature would now meet alternatingly in two different cities. So one year they would meet in Perth Amboy, which had been the capital of East Jersey, and the next year they would meet in Burlington, which had been the capital of West Jersey. So they in effect had alternating capitals. The first person appointed by the crown to govern New Jersey was a man named Lord Cornbury. Cornbury was already governor of New York, so he governed both colonies, which was not unusual back then for a colony to share a governor with another colony, but it's ironic because the proprietors had tried so hard to get out from under the thumb of New York, and here they are sharing a governor with them. Cornbury was vain and and arrogant and ambitious and offensive, and in addition to that, he also liked to wear women's clothing, and that offended just about everyone. He was eventually recalled and sent back to England. As I mentioned, the proprietors of East and West Jersey got to keep their land And so they, in this way, transitioned from medieval-style lords into capitalists running land companies now. Interestingly, the East Jersey Company, or Board of Proprietors, existed until 1998. It was the lineal descendant of that original Board of Proprietors. It decided to grant all its lands to the state of New Jersey because it didn't like the liabilities that it might incur by having to deal with lawsuits or toxic waste sites. The West Jersey Board of Proprietors still exists to this day in West Jersey. And in fact, if you go to buy property there in the area that was under the West Jersey Board of Proprietors and it has not been previously owned, you may end up having to buy it from this Board of Proprietors, which still exists today as a relic of colonial times. After New Jersey became a royal colony, the political situation stabilized somewhat. One of the signs that New Jersey was beginning to prosper was the fact that it had two colleges which are still in existence today. There was the College of New Jersey, which was later changed to Princeton University, which is now worldwide famous. And then there was Queens College in New Brunswick, which is now today known as Rutgers University. On the eve of the American Revolution, the population of New Jersey was approximately 130,000 people, with about 10,000 of them being slaves. New Jersey was not an inherently rebellious colony as Massachusetts had been, Nevertheless, there was severe resistance there to crown measures in the 1760s. Like all of the other colonies, resistance to the Stamp Act in 1765 was so severe that crown officials were not able to implement the Stamp Act in New Jersey, just as they were not able to implement it in any of the other colonies. Interestingly, the last royal governor of New Jersey was William Franklin, the son of Benjamin Franklin. It is speculated that he may have been appointed to this post with the hopes that he might be able to persuade his father to be more supportive of the king. Franklin was really in an impossible situation. On the one hand, he was expected to uphold the authority of British government, the king and parliament. On the other hand, he was being pressured by his own people in New Jersey to not enforce the laws that they did not agree with or that their assembly had no hand in making. All in all, Franklin was a pretty good governor, and he did a good job for a while juggling these two these two factions, but in the end, it was really impossible. In June of 1776, just a short time before we declared independence, Franklin was arrested and declared an enemy. He was eventually exchanged for John McKinley, who was the president of Delaware. The last few months of 1776 were not good for the American cause. The British had successfully flushed Washington out of New York and chased him across New Jersey. He crossed the Delaware, and with his ragged army, Washington sought refuge in Pennsylvania. With Washington safely out of the way, the British commander-in-chief, General Howe, decided it was time to go into winter quarters. Traditionally, European armies didn't do anything during the winter months because there was nothing for them to forage on or to eat. This was a desperate situation during the American Revolution, and Washington needed a victory badly or the whole cause could have collapsed. 
British General Howe had decided that he would garrison New Jersey with these Hessian troops. These were mercenary troops that the English king had hired from Germany to fill out his ranks. It was during this winter of 1776 and 77 that George Washington decided on one of the most daring and risky attacks of the entire war. On Christmas night, he crossed the Delaware River and attacked the Hessians at Trenton. We've all seen the pictures of Washington standing up in the boat with his men freezing in the sleet and the snow. This was a very daring and risky attack, and it could have gone wrong very easily, but many of the men's enlistments would be up at the end of the year, and Washington had to use them or lose them, literally. Luckily, the Hessians were completely surprised by this attack, and Washington was able to defeat the small garrison that the British had posted at Trenton. It was a small battle, but a much-needed victory, and it helped improve the sagging morale of the American cause. A few days later, Washington followed up this victory with another victory at Princeton. Despite these important victories, Washington was still in a desperate situation. His army had dwindled to very little, and he wasn't getting the supplies that he needed. Many of the people in New Jersey had taken oaths of loyalty to the king, and exactly a month after his victory at Trenton, Washington issued a proclamation telling them to either pledge allegiance to the United States or to leave. In the proclamation, Washington wrote, I do hereby declare that all and every person who may neglect or refuse to comply with this order within 30 days from this date that hereof shall be deemed adherents to the King of Great Britain and treated as common enemies of the American states. The British weren't too concerned about Washington. His little victories had been irritating, but they were content to let him freeze in the mountains of West New Jersey, and hopefully by the time of spring he and his men would be willing to come to terms and the American states would become colonies again and content themselves to be reliant on the king of Great Britain. For a colony that was so uninterested in getting involved in the war in the beginning, it's ironic that Washington and his army spent more time in New Jersey collectively than probably any one of the other states during the war. In 1779, from the excellent camp of Middlebrook, New Jersey, Washington invited several Delaware chiefs there, trying to persuade them to join the cause against the British, or at least keep them neutral. The Delaware had good reason to fear the British, because the Iroquois, their enemy, had mostly sided with the British. In his speech to the Delaware chiefs, Washington said the following, Brothers, I have read your paper. The things you have said are weighty things, and I have considered them well. The Delaware nation have shown their goodwill to the United States. They have done wisely, and I hope they will never repent. I rejoice in the new assurances you give of their friendship. The things you now offer to do to brighten the chain prove your sincerity. I am sure Congress will run to meet you and will do everything in their power to make the friendship between the people of these states and their brethren of the Delaware nation last forever. New Jersey produced two important people during the Revolutionary that I want to talk about. The first one is a man named John Witherspoon. Witherspoon was a Presbyterian clergyman of some reputation. At that time, Presbyterians had become a dominant force in the state of New Jersey. Witherspoon was selected as a member of the Continental Congress representing New Jersey, and he gave an important speech in favor of independence. In that speech, he emphasized how important independence was to the nation, saying, It not only was ripe for the measure, but in danger of rotting for the want of it. Two days later, when the Continental Congress adopted the Declaration of Independence, Witherspoon was one of its signers. There are family members of the modern actress Reese Witherspoon who claim to be descendants of John Witherspoon. I've never verified that for myself, so I don't know with certainty that's true or not. The other person I want to mention was a man named William Alexander, who at the time styled himself Lord Sterling. This was because he was a claimant to the earldom of Sterling, although he was never able to secure official recognition of his title to that claim. Sterling became one of Washington's trusted generals. He fought very heroically, especially at the Battle of Long Island, where he led his men bravely into several counterattacks against British and Hessian troops and perhaps saved a big chunk of Washington's army who were attempting to retreat. He was captured and later exchanged and continued to be one of Washington's trusted generals. For further reading, I recommend the following books and articles. Colonial New Jersey, A History, by John E. Pomfret. The Religious History of America, The Heart of the American Story from Colonial Times to Today, by Edwin Gaustad and Lee Schmidt. 1776, Year of Illusions, by Thomas Fleming. Washington's Crossing, by David Hackett Fisher. 
The Winter Soldiers, the Battles for Trenton and Princeton by Richard M. Ketchum. The Day is Ours, an inside view of the Battles of Trenton and Princeton, November 1776 to January 1777 by William M. Dwyer. Reinke's Journal of a Visit Among the Swedes of West Jersey, 1745, published in the Pennsylvania Magazine of History and Biography, Volume 33, Number 1, 1909. New Jersey, The Unique Proprietary, by Maxine M. Lurie, published in the Pennsylvania Magazine of History and Biography, Volume 111, Number 1, January 1987. And I highly recommend the following. Using the Records of the East and West Jersey Proprietors by Joseph R. Klett, published by the New Jersey State Archives, 